Good evening, everybody. Hey, how you doing? Uh, welcome to IGA Phoenix. Uh, there's a lot of you here. Ara is hyping this up quite a bit, I guess. Uh, <laughs> um, my name is Kyle. This is Corey. We are the co-chairs of IGA Phoenix. Uh, we're going to get things started with some announcements. Uh, ben. Uh, yeah, thanks. So first of all, thank you, Ara, for bringing such a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> it's all their fault. Because <laughs> uh, I have some actually some really awesome news. So um, two things. One, uh, hackathon. We've got an educational hackathon going on right now. Uh, one of the sponsors for a game called Pearson Education. Um, has given us a little bit of money to set something up for the next three weeks. So if you want to make an educational game, um, you can submit it for the hackathon, and then we'll, on May 16th, we'll have a big public uh, pitch event where you can win cash prizes. So the, the first prize, I think, is like $300, second, like $200, and like third, like $100. I'm looking for some more cash prizes, stuff like that, or extra prizes. But either way, I'm trying to push Phoenix here to do some educational games. And then the second thing, um, I managed to wrangle some money out of the city of Phoenix. So I've got $34,000 now from them from a grant that I can run an incubator for teams here in Phoenix. So I'm really excited about that. I can get four teams in. Um, we can give them services, mentors. Uh, we've got classes. We've got space you can come and use for free out in Tempe. Um, so really, really awesome. Really excited about that. And if you guys want to be part of that, you can go onto our website. There's an application process on there, and we kind of go through it. The first kind of first session will be from January, sorry, from June till September, and then the next one will be from October, probably to around January, something like that. So if you're interested in knowing more, let me know. Otherwise, check out our website. Thank you very much. Okay, next up, Greenlight Jam. Tyler, where's Tyler? There you are. Hey guys, so Greenlight Jam uh, has been running for almost a month now. Uh, we started at the end of March, and this weekend is the end of the Greenlight Jam. So for those who aren't familiar with it, it was a one month game jam with three weekends sparsed across that month of jamming, as well as just working on it when you can. Uh, the games that have been made are really high quality, uh, much further than what you'd expect to see at a game jam. Um, so this Sunday is the final showcase, Sunday at 6, so if you want to come see the games. Uh, we're also looking for judges, so if anyone is in the area um, who would like to come by Sunday evening to judge, uh, judges are welcome. And then finally on Thursday, the next Thursday, we're going to actually have a green light showcase. We're going to show all the games, each team is going to get up and present, and then we're going to announce and give away the awards for the jam for the, the full month. Um, so that's the green light jam. Any questions? What's up? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, it's all here. It's all at UAT. Um, this theater, pretty much, constantly. Even if you haven't been jamming all month, come out. Yeah, we could use support. So we actually did a play test today, and we'll probably do a play test again next week, um, either part of the Thursday event or on another day. So if you guys want to come and try the games as we well. Um, sure, it's Sunday at 6 p.m. and then Thursday at, Noah? Thursday at when? 6 p.m. here. Thursday, okay, so Thursday at 6 and Sunday at 6. Uh, next week, Thursday, not this week, Thursday. And this Sunday. Yes, and this Sunday. Okay, cool. Thanks. I think he'll be back at some point for another announcement. Um, Speaking of jams, Ludum Dare, a uh, online worldwide uh, solo d developer uh, competition game jam is happening this coming weekend. Starts Friday night, runs until Sunday night. Uh, there's also a uh, more casual uh, team version if you want to do that. That one is a three day jam, uh, but only the solo uh, developer games are judged. Um, there's probably going to be like 2,000 plus people uh, participating in this one. So if you guys want an excuse to game jam, there you go this weekend. Now, uh, Yoshi, you got uh, Good evening, everybody. Uh, ASU School of Computer Science is looking for the part-time instructor to teach the, uh, several game developing course. And uh, actually, four instructors. Uh, three for the uh, 2D game development using the game maker, and one instructor for the 3D game development. Uh, using the Unity, Photoshop, and the 3D Max. Uh, if you are interested in, you know, expand your teaching experience, uh, please uh, send uh, your resume, uh, my you know, email address, my cover at ASU Unity. Okay, and also the ASU has uh, also the summer camp 
uh, for middle school and high school kids. So if you know some you know kids are interested in uh, you know, running the video game, uh, please uh, come to me after the session. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, next up, Grave. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that thing. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll just make it quick. But um, So, we launched our Kickstarter for Grave. Um, it's been running for about a month now. It ends this weekend. Um, right now, we're close to 24,000 as of uh, a few minutes ago. But, um, yeah, our goal is 30. So, we're getting there. Um, and we would appreciate anybody spreading the word, letting people know about the game. Um, other than that, I guess, uh, thanks guys. All right, that's it. Okay. Another Go Kickstarter. Back to slide, Go back to it, oh yeah, jot that. Uh, also, if you guys want to, uh, we'll post these on the website as well, or you guys can email us if you want any more details about stuff. Hey guys, so Hex Heroes is wrapping up tonight and they just hit their goal, so round of applause for Hex Heroes. Um, so they're aiming for 80,000, right now they're at 81K, um, so they have a couple hours left, so if you want to back the Kickstarter now while it's still there, um, it was really a last minute finish, just, just like earlier this morning it finally hit the goal. Uh, it's a great Wii U game and PC title. It's a party RTS. So it's kind of like an RTS that you'd play like Mario Party or something with friends there locally. Um, so please check it out and give it your backing. Thanks. Okay, next up, Tim Winsky with his Adventure Time game he's been working on in secret. <laughs> Come on, everybody. Everybody. Yeah, so uh, for the last 10 months, uh, the two of us and some guy none of you know living <laughs> in another state been working on um, a game for Cartoon Network. We did it. Yeah. So I'm just going to, I guess, yeah, so we did our reveal at PAX, actually. We were at the Cartoon Network booth. Um, and I'm just going to, I guess, go and show our reveal trailer thingy. It's Tim made it. He did a really good job. <laughs> I was really surprised. <laughs> I you didn't know you were working at Time this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Just like drawing me some goats. Another trailer. <laughs> I wasn't there doing the arm. This isn't that baby or, goat video, is it? it? It is. Well, it has goats in it. Oh, yeah. We have a development blog and websites and whatever. So, yeah. You want, the name of the game is uh, Adventure Time Time Tangle. Uh, I think I have the trailer on here. Yeah, oh yeah, there it is. in the summer, guys. Yep. <laughs> it's for kids. <laughs> no, we're not for kids. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, this is an announcement from me. If anybody out there wants to give a talk at IGDA Phoenix, uh, that's roughly a half hour or so, uh, about something to do with game development or something you're passionate about relating to games or anything like that, uh, please email chair at igdaphx.org. That'll go to me and Corey, and we can set you up with like a slot in one of our upcoming meetings. Um, we're always looking for speakers or people that want us to talk about whatever, or you can host a discussion about some topic in games, uh, anything like that. So now I turn the floor over to you guys. Uh, if you have any bonus announcements that I didn't know about ahead of time, you can raise your hand and stand up and give your announcement. Anybody? Just a second here.
Does anybody who remembers me from December when we did the big everybody do a demo thing, you may have seen me demo Cops and Robbers then. It looks something like this. This was a very early alpha build. <laughs> So I just wanted to show you guys what I've been up to since then. Made it a little bit more advanced. Now it looks something like this. This demo is now available up on the internet over at uh, copsandrobbersgame.com if you're interested in playing it. It's just the first level right now. There will be four levels available in the demo. There's actually 20 levels overall once the game is finished, which should hopefully be finished in the next couple of months. Um, otherwise, you can follow me on uh, Sylvanus underscore S for, uh, on Twitter, or you can visit my website, silvermoonfire.com, to see everything I'm up to and has my Facebook, Yahoo, all, Facebook, YouTube, all that fun stuff. But basically just want to give you guys an update of what I was doing. Thanks a lot. Okay, any other bonus announcements? Going once. Okay. Uh, okay, so if you guys have any questions, uh, if you guys want to contact me or Corey for any reason about IGDA or whatever, uh, that email address will reach both of us. Uh, if you guys want to know who to contact about what announcement you saw at the meeting, uh, we can put you in touch with the right people. Uh, for our upcoming meetings and events related to the game development scene in Phoenix, uh, we're, we're on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, we post uh, our upcoming meetings on both of those, as well as our uh, blog at igdaphx.org. And uh, I think with that, I will turn the floor over to Ara, who's going to blow our minds with some video game knowledge. <laughs> okay, so this talk is called, thank you Google, Video Games Learning and Unintended Consequences. Okay, so first thing I want to talk about before I get into it is this, this, this talk is about games as learning devices. So I want to tell you a little bit about what I mean by games as a learning device. So, I'm not talking about the kind of learning that you're taught in a class or in school, necessarily. What I'm talking about is the kind of learning that you learn in a skill game or any kind of skill activity, um, such as basketball or chess or street fighter, right? All of these things have, um, are activities that as part of just your practice in performing the activity, uh, that's how you learn the activity itself. So this is the kind of learning I'm talking about. And I want to start off as a premise that games, and video games specifically, are really, really, really good learning devices. And if you don't take that at face value, um, I don't want to belabor uh, all the introductory stuff. So a whole bunch of really smart people, like all of these guys, have written a whole bunch of really smart books on why that can be and why that is so. Um, so we're just going to take as a premise that games are really, really good learning devices. And if you don't believe it, read some of those books. Um, so if we know that games have great potential to teach, the thing that's interesting is that right, just like real teachers in real life, there are some better than others. There are some games that are better teachers at teaching you how to play the game itself than others. <coughs> Right? And at the same time, some games have more to learn from than others. So I'm making a fine distinction here. <laughs> this is basically how good is the game at teaching you what it is, and this is how deep, how much depth, or how much does the game have to teach you in the first place. So both of those things vary between games. And I'm not necessarily, once again, talking about like pre-algebra, the game, <laughs> whether versus you know something like Call of Duty, or even, um, right, 
pre-algebra, the what you learn about pre-algebra in school, not necessarily the game. Not necessarily talking about that comparison, but consider instead. Okay, how much do you have to learn from a game like Call of Duty versus this? And how well does it teach itself to you? Or consider these two games, right? Totally different kinds of subjects. Or maybe, right, these two games. Super deep content, but of completely different types. In both of those games, you have a lot to learn from, and they have a lot to teach you, but they're just completely different types of learning. So what we're going to go over today is there's four things that I've noticed that happen in the game industry in terms of really common development practices. And they're unintentionally compromising this potential of games, this ability, this innate ability that games have to teach you uh, basically how to do the game or whatever it is the game is teaching. Right, so here's what they are. One of them is methods that improve monetization. If you saw my free to play talk, um, we got a section that's like that. Um, the second one is methods that improve accessibility. I'll show you how those things also hamper learning. Third one is this is a fancy way of studying something very simple, systems that simulate skill improvement, which we'll talk about too. And also methods that are commonly used to increase excitement, right? So these have some negative effects on how you learn the game too. So this first part, I'm, I'm bored of talking about this topic because I've talked about it 20 times. Um, so you can, if you really want to know all the details about this, you can listen to one of my past lectures. I can tell you exactly which one if you're interested uh, after the fact. But I'm just going to skip these and get to the point of this one so also we don't run out of time again. <laughs> so the point of this is basically it's um, the way a lot of free-to-play games are monetized, they're done so in a way that specifically is at the expense directly of learning itself. And so... You know, I talked about Battletoads, and it's a really hard game, but it's not that hard because you can actually learn it, and there's something called Jetpack Joyride, which seems easy, but then later on, it gets really hard, and you don't know why, and it's because they're actually artificially stopping you from progressing so that they can make you a sales pitch, so you can buy the item that will make you surmount the obstacle that's stopping you, and you feel better, but you haven't learned anything in the process. That's the gist of this part of it. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. There's, okay. So basically what they do, right, is they, they're statistically able to control everybody's progress irrespective of their skill. And so the way it trains you is that it basically trains you that um, if you want to get far in the game or if you want to make rapid progress, you have to do so by purchasing your way out. Um, or you have to muddle through a lot of um, slot machine type of mechanisms. But in, in either case, you're only learning up to a point, and then once you approach what, what I call the late game, there's not really a lot of learning involved, because that's, that's where they give you the sales pitch. And the thing to remember about this is that this will happen every time you have a proposition to the player where you can pay money to get a significant game outcome advantage. Anytime you have that happening, is when you'll have this problem. Okay, so that was the old stuff. So let's get into the new interesting stuff. So I want to talk about accessibility and how games games have gotten a lot more accessible, but they've done so at the expense of learning, and I want to show you guys why. So there's a couple of problems here with just the whole prospect of uh, selling a video game in the first place because you have a special problem in video games that virtually no other medium has when you compare it to something like, I don't know, music or books. Games challenge you in ways that none of those other media challenge you. Like, okay, you can talk about a challenging book, but the most challenging aspect of a book is that it's maybe hard to read. Maybe you go slower. You don't understand what a word means. You have to look it up or whatever. There's nothing like in a book, right, something that stops you and sends you back four pages and you have to start over. That doesn't happen, right? These are special. I mean, it sounds silly, right? But 
This happens in games, and this is a really special consideration. Because what this means is that, just like, well, here's what it comes down to. If you don't think you can play a game, you won't buy it, will you? So you are automatically, if there's a game that you think is too hard or inaccessible by whatever means, um, you are not their customer automatically. And so what the business person normally says is that, well, I want to be able to sell my product to as many people as I can, right? Because the more people I can sell it to, the more money I can make potentially. And the less accessible the game is, the less players I'm going to have potentially. So conversely, right, if I make the game more accessible, more people can play it and my potential customer pool just increases. So what could be wrong about making the game more accessible? <coughs> Anyone want to take a stab? It might be boring. Too easy. Like, that's true. It might be boring. Yeah. Anyone else have any other ideas? No. You can't take as much enjoyment per person. It's just like an average, right? Well, what do you mean by that? So many types of well, it's common ground. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, the challenge isn't there. A lot of the time, it's not nearly as fun. Yeah, that's true. So, what's happened in the industry, especially in what we've called like these triple AAA games, by and large, over the past like ten years or so, maybe, is that. The industry has taken great lengths and great efforts to make their games as accessible as possible, but there's pitfalls when you do this. There's problems because there's different ways to accomplish this. And depending on which way you use, you are basically making a trade of how, many, how much resources you're taking up. And at the same time, it's actually, this is not apparent right now, but it'll be in a second. Um, you're actually impacting how much you can learn from the game by just making it, um, by just doing it the easiest way possible. And the way that that's happened is because pretty much the de facto industry way to make a game uh, more accessible, however they define that, is by doing something I call barrier removal, which is they use metrics of whatever kind to figure out, okay, well, you know, here's our partially made game and players are getting stuck here, there, and in these other places. And so, um, you know, oh, what, what can we do to make the players get past these obstacles that we've set up for them? Well, the simplest way to do it is to just take out the barrier, right? And then people progress farther. And this has been happening, this is so pervasive, because it's the cheapest way to basically address a problem of why are people getting stuck here in this game? You just take out the obstacle, or you take out the teeth that the obstacle has, or you make it easier in some way. And normally, by all the metrics that people use to measure these sorts of things, everything looks great. You think that, OK, like, well, everyone used to die here. Now they're getting past it, so everything's much better, right? But this is extremely dangerous, because what's happening is that the metrics that the industry traditionally uses does not capture all of the effects that are imposed upon the player when these types of things happen. And um, so I want to talk about, there's different ways, these are three ways that I noticed that games traditionally make themselves more accessible. Who can guess what I mean by health meter inflation? Meter gets bigger. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's it. Mistakes before you are set back, or getting set back doesn't really, you know, matter. Right. Um, can anybody think of an example of a game where maybe that's happened to them? Halo. Okay, wait, wait, hold on. <laughs> every <laughs> FPS was over here? I said Halo. Halo, okay. Uh, mostly without shield work throughout the series. Some of the shields in one instance, it doesn't absorb a lot, and then later instances, it seems like your shield is instantly recharging, so it's effectively always up. Yeah, but you know, there's like there's like a time limit thing in there, right? So if you get shoot at quickly enough, um, then it doesn't count. But in other situations, that's true. Yeah. But when it doesn't count, if it's like kind of in built into the character that they have this like, as the game goes on, their health bar gets bigger and bigger, and then you get to the point where you just become unkillable. Like, is that going to count? 
important. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I just finished a project where we were A-B testing, and uh -huh. players that spent money, we made it more difficult, so they would die more. Ooh. <laughs> do, you know, do you know if the players know that that's what is happening to you? That wasn't my responsibility. <laughs> 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 okay, let's let's leave that one alone for a second. Braid, braid, where you can rewind the die and just rewind it. So that's not actually it, because that's a situation where someone correct me if I'm wrong. It's been a long time since I played braid, but you can just rewind as much as you want. But that doesn't mean that it helps you any to surmount any given obstacle, does right. it? Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Legend of Zelda. How so? gain more and more and more hearts as you find them. Oh yeah, okay. So those are a bunch of good examples. Um, you want, okay, one more, that's it. Um, Call of Duty died three times in a row, you got a death streak, you got a perk, that makes it Ooh, that's like something I'm going to talk about in a second. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of like this, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's good though. Okay, so here's what they do in a lot of games, right, is they make the game easier just by giving you more health at certain times in certain places. And this is like the top number one way to make a game more accessible because it's the cheapest way to do it. Most games have some kind of representation of health, so it's really easy to modulate. It's just one variable, right? Add as much health as you want. And the problem with this kind of approach is that you're increasing accessibility by making it easier to surmount whatever obstacles, but you're doing that by reducing the severity of penalties that the player is going to get. And that's the important part because what happens is if penalties become reduced enough, you're going to ignore them, aren't you? And um, this is kind of like, here's an example. Like, let's say you're playing, I'm just gonna make up a platformer off the top of my head, right? So, you're moving left and right, and let's say you can press a button to shoot a projectile, right? And let's say you can jump too. Let's say it's like Mario, Super Mario Brothers with a gun. So let's say there's this enemy who's shooting at you and he shoots like, you know, above waist height, so you can duck to dodge his shots. But in a situation where if it was one hit to get killed, right, how do you overcome this enemy? Well, you have to walk up to him and jump over his shots, and then you have, you know, let's say, okay, let's say you can kill him by jumping on him. Let's say that works, right? So that's the dynamic that you have to master in order to overcome that challenge. Now, let's say you could take like 100 shots before you got killed. Well, what happens in that sort of situation when your health meter is huge is you play a very different game, don't you? You play the game of, um, because, I mean, you could dodge the bullets, right? But that's more cognitively challenging than not doing it. So why would you do it if you don't have to? And what you end up doing a lot of times is you end up playing this weird statistical game where you're like, okay, I'm noticing how much damage I'm taking in, right? This is the whole damage per second thing in RPGs. And I'm noticing, you know, okay, maybe suddenly I have a gun and I can shoot him too, right? So I'm noticing the rate at which his health is going down and the rate at which my health is going down. And I'm making some kind of like decision like by observing that over time. That's a very, very different game dynamic. So what this actually is doing, besides uh, all the other bad effects I'm gonna mention, is it actually completely changes the game dynamic. And if you're not aware of this, well, this is really bad because you should be implementing things with certain intention, shouldn't you? So you have to know how this works in order to understand how doing it one way or the other is going to affect the dynamics in the game. So the example I came up with was Castlevania. This is kind of conflated a little bit because there's different units, but I think it still works. Um, who's played Castlevania the first one? Okay, so that's about at least half of you. Right, so in that game you had like, you had a 16 unit health meter, but everything took off a little bit different amount of health. So give or take, you probably got like four or eight hits before you died. And by the time Castlevania got to like Symphony of the Night, well, it's all RPG style, so you have huge thousand plus unit health meter that keeps growing. And even though that, I guess it equates to maybe you get maybe about 10 to 50 hits depending on what is attacking you before you die. But the irony is, right, Anyone disagree with me if you, if you feel it's true, but in this game it was way harder to, t to avoid enemies than even this game, wasn't it? Just to even make contact, avoid contact in the first place. Okay, so the second thing they do when they try to make games accessible is 
what I call rewards for failure, kind of like what you were saying a second ago. So some games actually reduce the difficulty of whatever challenge they presented you with upon failure. Without reducing the reward. Well, yeah, that's true. They don't do that either. Um, can anyone think of any examples? Yes. Um, recent uh, 3D Mario games have had this system where after maybe like five or six deaths on a level, mm -hmm. there'll be a block that shows up at the beginning of the level and it gives you a super power up that makes you be able to just kind of run through the level and without much consequence. Okay, but you have the choice. It is a choice. You still, you have a choice. Okay, yeah. Choice. yeah Ninja Gaiden mm -hmm. or Xbox was another good example. It does give you a choice. After you've died a couple of times, at the game over screen it says, do you want to reduce the difficulty? Yeah, I'll do a pitch, basically. Yeah, it's so, insults you for sucking at the game. Okay, so that's kind of like his thing, which is like it gives you a choice of changing. So I'm not actually not talking about that. That's a slightly yeah. different dynamic. There are some examples where the game, without even asking you or telling you, is making it easier. Rubber banding in yeah. racing games. That's that. that's like a whole section. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that one. This isn't exactly like that because it does. Uh, in a way, but any game where you die and yeah. enemies that you have already killed after that checkpoint, you go back and they're gone still. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Um, there was a game, I don't remember exactly what game I was playing, but there was a game when you died, it actually reduced the number of enemies in the level just to make it so that you would get hit less. Was that was it obvious to you that it was doing that? Yeah. Yeah. Especially after the third time you died, and you're like, where is everybody? <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about like specific examples? Not like I played a game 20 years ago and I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, there um, If you don't turn it off in the settings, tower fall goes in the multiplayer mode. Basically, if you don't have as many kills as other players, you can start in the shield. Okay. Uh, Unreal Tournament uh, 2004, the final boss had this thing where if he had a bunch more kills than you, yeah. his AI would become dumber. So like the optimal way to beat the game to beat him yeah. was to let the timer run down and have him get a bunch of kills at you, and then you just kill a bunch of time when he's dumb as dirt. Any, anyone played the newest Mortal Kombat? Some somebody told me the last boss does that sort of thing too, where it's like if you the first battle he'll crush you, and then the second fight he's like twenty times easier. Yeah, in the back. Uh, so it, it's a mode, not a whole game, but. Yeah. Uh, Hmm. It's what? actually intended to allow you to learn the mechanics without dying. But is that like, uh, is it some kind of like introductory mode in that case? Or? It is, right? Yeah, okay, that's cool. All right, so there was a talk about this at GDC this <laughs> year. Uh, it was the Shenmue postmortem. Okay. And what happens in Shenmue is the more you die, the dumber the AI becomes. It stops blocking and it's. It, isn't as aggressive, and it makes it easier for you to beat the enemies. Wow, I never noticed that actually. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this qualifies, but um, I play this game called uh, Path of Exile. Okay. And if you play the hard point league, if your character dies, they automatically demote you to standard, and um. <laughs> In the standard league, it doesn't matter if you die. It just respawns. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, let's do like let's like who's got a really juicy one? I'm gonna do like one more. Someone. Okay. How about you? Middle school, special ed program. <laughs> well, sometimes it feels like that. Okay. So, let's. We got more things to talk about. Um, who's played Ratchet and Clank? You know they do this in Ratchet and Clank. Yeah, anytime you're in a section of the game where uh, it's one of those like um, linear progression sections, like you have to like run away from something or you have to like get from point A to point B in a certain time, um, what happens is if you lose, and the only reason why I know this is because they told me, if you lose, it makes it easier and then it starts you over. And then if you lose again, it keeps doing that until you win. And I never actually noticed. I was completely unaware of it until they had, they had told me. 
Um, but Insomniac likes to do that a lot. A bunch of Naughty Dog games do that quite a bit. So there's kind of another way this happens, and you can. One way to eliminate failure is to just reward the player no matter what they do. And the best, the most beautiful example that I've ever seen of this was Burnout 3. They started this in Burnout 3. Before Burnout 3, Burnout was an actual game where what you did mattered. <laughs> Starting in Burnout 3, they decided, you know what? This game is going to be just as much about crashing as it is racing. <laughs> but the problem with that is that when you're crashing, right, you can't be winning a race because you're crashing. And if you want to win a race, you can't be crashing. They're like precisely diametrically opposed goals that if you're doing one, it's preventing you from doing the other. And the funny thing about Burnout 3 is that they reward you just as intensely for doing crashing activities as they do for you actually winning races. Um, so you get, it's, it's just this very strange thing that you get into. I guess you could still, you could still fail that game if you like didn't crash, but then also drove really slowly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's something I call contrarian achievements, which is kind of does this in a smaller way. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of examples of, you know, whenever there's an achievement list for a game, there's. Oftentimes, there's a few achievements that are like, I don't know, like lose 20 times, right? Yeah, it's just like do, some, do something that's like not really the goal of the game. Anyway, um, now we've gone we've through enough examples. So the point I want to make with all this, and this is a really important distinction to make, is that this is not the same as reframing failure as you're practicing and learning in a safe place. What this is is actually all of these things are literally, there's a challenge that's been presented to you and the goalposts are moved to you closer and closer until you pass through, as opposed to you learning how to get past them. Does that make sense? Okay, so the third way this happens is something I call heat map abuse. Does somebody want to say what a heat map is? You. Basically, it's taking the map and it's having different events, and it's because it's location based, you can uh, make charts and heat maps to see like where it's happening the most. Yeah, exactly. So here's an image I found. This is some heat map of some platformer, and that's basically what they did, right? You plot where your players die, you record sessions, and then you take that data and you generate this kind of like fall off thing here with the red in the middle, right? So. The red is where it's happening the most, and the fall off colors are where it's happening less. And normally, the way this is applied in game development is a lot of developers use this to figure out where people are dying, where people are having the most trouble with the game, right? Or conversely, you can think of this as, right, like where do people decide that the game's too much for them and they give up? And so the common thing that happens is what developers do is they notice where people are dying and then they basically reduce the challenge or the penalties that are dispensed at wherever this is or those spikes over there until the playtests show metrics that they like. In other words, until people don't get stopped too much. But the problem with doing this is that you're defeating the purpose of the obstacle you presented the player with, aren't you? Because the whole purpose of an obstacle was to give the player a challenge, and now what you're doing is instead of considering, instead of making a revision to figure out what, is the, what was the player missing, why couldn't they actually overcome that challenge, what information did they need to know that they didn't understand, what do they need to master that they haven't mastered yet in order to overcome this challenge, Instead of figuring that part out, how to teach the player, what you did was you just pushed more people through the gate. And it's, it's, a, it's a bandage, right? It's, you haven't, there are underlying problems there that you haven't addressed. And instead of dealing with them, you're just completely foregoing the whole thing. And so anytime you're engaging in this kind of method of making your game more accessible, 
barrier removal, you're always sacrificing learning for easier and faster progress. Right? It's kind of like you fail a test and you get a good grade anyway. Right? Somebody said something like that over here. So what I want to impress upon you guys is instead of doing things like this, consider what it takes to actually teach the player to get over that obstacle. Consider that you as a game designer, it's your responsibility to teach the player through the medium of the game itself how to overcome the obstacles you are presenting them. Because that's what you are. You're a teacher as a game designer and you're teaching your players and the game is the medium through which you're communicating this. Okay, so let's say you're a business person and you like to make money or you're in the game business and you like to make money. Uh, and you might ask, okay, well this is all great and this is, you know, sounds like it's all feeling good stuff, but why does this matter? Who cares? Why does this matter to selling games? Well, it matters a lot to selling games too. Because the thing is, is that a player who's actively learning in some kind of system that you've designed, you know for a fact that that player is necessarily maximally engaged because they're in an active learning state. You'll know that already. And so you want players to be engaged as strongly as possible with your game and having a game that not only teaches them what the game is in an accessible way, but also offers depth for them to actually stay engaged is the best way to do that. And if the game isn't good at teaching itself to you, well then you're going to be losing, you're not going to be engaging as many players and you're going to be losing players, all other things being equal, right? And so what ends up happening is that if you don't, if you don't have these types of things in your game with sufficient depth, and if that depth isn't sufficiently accessible in the first place, then you're compromising uh, taking advantage of this aspect of games in the first place, which is their ability to motivate you through the process of learning whatever it is you're learning. Because getting better at something feels really good, doesn't it? You know, when you get better at something, you want to keep doing it. Okay, so let's go part three. This is all new. This, we didn't get to this last time, I think. So maybe we got a little, okay. Maybe we got to a little bit of it. Who can guess what I mean by statistical skill simulation? RPGs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who can guess uh, something more precise and narrow that I'm talking about? Grinding. Yes, grinding. All right. Because that's, because that's what happens, right? So RPGs, okay. So you can still have statistical skills simulation without grinding. <laughs> you can. I'm gonna, I'm gonna break it down. So, what I'm defining as grinding is, it has, it's a task that has to be repetitive, and it has to be uninteresting, and it increases your agency in the game, right? So in other words, you kill enemies. You have a stat called attack. You kill enough enemies and the attack power stat goes up, so you're, now you're doing more damage. That is increasing your player agency, right? So this is like experience point levels, or it's kind of like farming for drops and stuff. In a lot of situations in games, it's broken down like this. There's an obstacle for you to overcome, and the outcome of whether you're successful in overcoming that obstacle or not is dependent on a couple factors. It's partially dependent on how good you are, Right? There's a skill component, I'm calling there's n percent of that, depending on context. And then there's a statistical component that factors into the result, and we're calling that n percent, right? So in a game where you can grind, you can modulate the difficulty of what you're dealing with by grinding, because that increases m, and thereby it's an easier challenge for you. So yeah, so sometimes it's a factor of both. Now, I have a friend who's like an old school gamer, um, and he used to like actually, remember, remember Jason Rigo Trapper? Jason Rigo said this all the time. He said that the reason why we had grinding, at least in the old days, right, was not because you have to grind, but because you can grind. Grinding from the beginning was a alternate means to give the player a way to overcome a challenge that they can't figure out how to do on the given terms that they're presented. Does that make sense? So if you're not good enough, you can trade some time to get a linear reward that's 
relative to your time investment to make the game statistically more favorable so that you can have an easier time. And this is interesting because consider what you're doing in this, in this grind, right? You're, you're trading time out of your life for the promise of a expected linear reward, aren't you? And compare this to what you do in a pure skill situation, um, like let's say Street Fighter or something, right? Where you're practicing to get better at it, but in a pure skill situation, there is no, there's no guarantees that you're actually gonna get better. There's no guarantee that any net time you put in is going to net you any output one way or the other. It's all up to you. So it's a lot more cognitively stressful, isn't it, to try and do something with effort. This is a lot easier. Let's just spend some time and grind. In fact, the funny part is I was talking about barrier removal as a way of increasing accessibility. Grinding is actually an implementation that allows the player to personally modulate removing barriers for themselves according to their taste. But here's the problem, is that well, you, know, you can grind as much as you want and there's diminishing returns. That's usually how it works. But now we have games, this didn't used to be the case. I, I don't know if I can think of a date. If anybody thinks of like when, if a date around like when this actually happened, that would be interesting to know. But basically, now we have games where we didn't before, where all you do is grind. It's not that you have a choice to grind or not. Can anybody think of an example of a game that does that? Does it? You gotta get some stone to build that giant castle. Yeah, well, maybe in a different way. Okay, let's, let's think about some other ones. Warframe. Sorry? Warframe. Warframe. Can you describe that in like uh, 10 seconds? Warframe is a game where you would go through the same level over and over again to see if you can get a certain drop that happens that either gives you a part for a new weapon or a mod that increases the damage of the weapon. But there is no real end goal. It's just you want to do level over and over again to improve yourself. Is, is any skill involved? It, that depends on how you want to play. Stats would up. The level of your mods and gear basically hinder your skill. So like if you pop a headshot <laughs> on a guy, if your weapon's not good enough, you just you're not gonna do the damage necessary. But if you have the weapon, like through grinding, it's incredibly easy. Is it a free to play game? Yes. yes. That's figures. Okay. <laughs> and, yes. This became very common when MMOs came out. Yeah. Mm. A way to lengthen how long the player's going to be playing your game. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Back to the future. Uh, yeah? Pokemon. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <Just laughs> back to the earliest RPGs, like, how do you skill your way through Final Fantasy 1? Like, no amount of skill will allow you to beat Chaos at level 1. I mean, there's no possible way that exists. It is entirely, there's almost... You can choose the yeah, right some of them were pretty rough like that. Do you yeah. think they were like doing that on purpose, or do you think that that was just like, oh, it just ended up where it ended up and I whatever? Think they thought it was an interesting design aesthetic, and they didn't understand the consequences of it. Yeah, that's that's fair. My question was, uh, does it count as grinding if you know you have to be level ten to get to kill this monster or something? But on the way there, yeah, uh, you're not given enough quests or whatever it is that levels you up. Uh, to be level 10 or something that will allow you to kill that monster. Like, is that still is it a, grinding in between? I guess the question is, is it a hard gate or not? Right, that's what it comes down to. If there's a way that you can overcome without actually being level 10 um, that involves skill, not just random luck, then I, I guess that's the difference there. Yeah? So I guess any challenge of a level cap to start? Uh, well, I don't know what you mean. Well, like, you need to be... You need to be level 20 to go to this area. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they usually do that also, like, as a means of, like, saying, you know, like, th like they know the how much experience you have with yeah. the game based on your level. So they do that to kind of, like, yeah. introduce things gradually to you. Yeah, Tim. Well, <laughs> uh, so you talked about Jetpack Joyride already, but yeah. um, Infinite Runners more and more has, uh, they, they become more uh, games that are less about trying to get further and more games about uh, seeing different numbers go up. Uh, one of the design decisions that became really trendy that surprised me the most was actually like score multipliers that you got after playing the game for a really long time. Have you yeah. ever seen that? 
Um, so it's like you actually see yourself getting two or three times the score. For like like after you die, well. like the like the slot machine thing in Jetpack Joyride, and you get a couple bonuses. Or um, well, it's, it's it's more like what Temporal Run Two actually did this. The first one didn't. Mm. Um, like a streak multiplier? No, no, just like a permanent score multiplier that lasts every oh, every really? additional time you play the game. So it's uh, so that that's just an artificial way to like show uh, the player getting a significantly higher score for performing exactly the same way. So the third time you play, the multiplier is higher than the first time, even though nothing else is different. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's that's not contrived at all. Okay, maybe like one more really juicy. Juicy. Just like perfect note, uh, the Peter Molyneux game where all you did was tap the cube. That's just all grinding, right? Curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> okay, one more. <laughs> okay, David. <laughs> what, about, what about your Street Fighter example, learning combos? You have to practice the combo over and over and over until <laughs> in your muscle memory you can just pull it off. Mm -hmm. If you consider that grinding. No, because... Why? You have performed a process that is repetitive. But, well, no, I disagree that if you're trying to do it and you can't do it after a while, but then you figure out how to do it, I would say that it is interesting. But during the time where you just have to practice it and practice it and practice it, you're drilling. You, you are drilling. So, okay, so this is really interesting. We're going to go off on a tangent here for a second. <laughs> because, because this is like... There's, I put a little bit of something related to this. It's, it's going to take a minute. <laughs> there's, um, there's something that there, I have a little bit later on about the, the affinity of, there's certain kind of activities that have like a greater affinity to learning than other kinds. And it, maybe, maybe this is the thing that like John Blow is talking about with his new game that he wants to explore, right? But it's, it, because it's, it's, to me, it's mostly... Well, I mean, shit. I mean, I haven't figured it out at all. But it's like, work with me here. <laughs> Refresh my memory. <laughs> yeah, so here's the funny thing, right? Like, there's some things that you do that when you drill a lot, at some point, you're like, wait, I figured out how to do this thing I've been trying to do. Like, like doing the fireball. Sure, it has right? the potential to then, like, have this payoff. Yeah. Well, there's the thing that's interesting to me is that there are so many things that are required in operational knowledge. In other words, like like playing Street Fighter is operational knowledge, right? Um, that require like a lot of practice and drilling. And then I just at, there's just like a point where it's like okay, now your body has learned it, right? In both muscle memory and like everything together. And now you can say you've mastered it. I mean, that's like the kind of learning I'm talking about. But you're right, it is kind of funny because sometimes it can feel like you're getting nowhere, right? Because if it's, if you don't, if you don't figure it out at a certain threshold, then you feel like you are grinding and you are getting nowhere. Yeah, and it's worse because you're not actually seeing an incremental reward. That's true. And so this is funny because these devices are kind of like a compensatory mechanism for dealing with that scenario, right? Okay, so yeah, Karen. I would argue that the main difference is that if I were to start up my Street Fighter game and someone that has already done that, walks up to it, they would be able to do the combo. It's not imposed by the game that you had to have practiced that many times before you've unlocked it, as opposed to it's your skill level or not. Yeah, it, it gets a little gray, and I'm not really sure how best to resolve that. Yeah, in the back. I think that, you know, if we, if we focus on the word grinding, then it's fuzzy, but when you go back to what grinding was shorthand for, which is statistical um, substitution, like simulating a skill. Yeah. Um, the skill is actual. It's, it's really there. You really did learn the skill of entering this combo so that in your brain, you're not thinking of the button combination anymore. You're thinking of the resulting action. Right. You do it. Right. And I don't think that anyone would say someone practicing their golf swing or their or their free throws is grinding. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, I don't think David was actually <laughs> saying that, but I think he was getting at the, this 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 grayness that we're all seem to be unsure of, which was a really good point. Yeah. Well, I think it's just the distinction between player skill and character skill. Like when you're increasing your player skill, that's something you're actively engaged in. When you're increasing your character skill, that's not something you're directly really engaging with. Yeah. It's your character. Skill. It's a number that governs things. It's not. It has nothing to do with skill, does it? Right. Oh, yeah. 
Stacy. Well, I think that's why it's interesting, especially when you're looking at MMOs or something like that. People think they're really good. They think they've learned the skills when all they're maybe doing is clicking buttons. And yeah. They're just doing the same thing, but they you get that illusion that you've actually learned something. I'm actually really good at this game. I'm really good at clicking my mouse better than you are, kind of thing. You do. I'm so glad you mentioned that because that totally leads into the rest of what we got here. So here, so here's the funny thing is that when, so that was the whole point of why we had grinding in the first place. And there's some unintentional bad side effects, right, as you might have suspected. So that's one of them that Stacy said, right? And here's the funny thing is that you end up when you're engaged, like, look, I've been engaged in a lot of grinds. I'm sure a lot of you guys have. Um, engaged enough so that you tell, at least you tell yourself that it's worth it, right? Um, well, some, I mean, look, sometimes, I mean, I'm kind of being, I'm kind of being smarmy about it, but, but I mean, I've, I've grinded for hours and hours and I felt like it was worth it, seriously worth it. Um, but the funny thing is, is that you end up, you, you end up in this loop of activity, right, where you're not actually being entertained by the activity, you're not really learning anything from the activity, but it's just rewarding enough. You're getting an extrinsic reward out of it, which is the, um, you know, it's, it's nothing like pressing a lever 20 times to get a pellet or anything like that. <laughs> and it's self-reinforcing in a way because here's, here's the thing, right? So like, go back to that example of um, that platform I was talking about, which was before grinding. Or even consider grinding. When you're doing this kind of activity, right, you can, it's like, okay, well, there's two ways I can surmount this challenge. I can go the cognitively demanding way, or I can go the less cognitively demanding way. And the thing is, is that when humans are given this choice, they will almost always, unless they have a really good reason otherwise, they're going to pick the less cognitively demanding way out of a problem. And grinding in most games is balanced just so exquisitely so that you can, you don't have to use your brain, you can get past the stuck part, and all you need to do is put in this amount of time, and it's worth it, and you feel fulfilled, and you keep doing it. Um, there's one thing that I want to also mention is that sometimes, right, basically what happens is that you're, you're doing this activity and you're getting an extrinsic reward, but you're not getting any intrinsic reward out of it. And in some contexts, in some situations, it's been shown that when you have that type of dynamic, what ends up actually happening is that you, it's completely counterintuitive in a way, but you actually dislike doing the activity more and you actually get worse at it rather than get better. It's kind of, there's, there's this one famous story. Um, back in the 80s, there was this nationwide program to get kids to read more. And so they're like, how are we gonna get kids to read more? I know, we'll give them pizza because everybody likes pizza. So what they actually found out is that by way of rewarding a reader for reading a book by giving them pizza, they actually were less interested in reading as a result. Probably because they were thinking of pizza the whole time. I like but, giving it for pizza. <laughs> but, 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 but the joke, the joke was that like, well, maybe instead what they should have done is uh, rewarded kids' books for eating pizza, and then they would have been more motivated to read the books. Oh, no. No, they just wouldn't like pizza anymore. <laughs> okay. Two, two more parts, and then we're done. Um, so, this is what I'm calling um, excitement, things that developers do to make the game more exciting at the expense of learning. And who can, well, now it's too late, it's already done. But I'm talking about rubber banding, basically. Does someone want to say what rubber banding is? Yeah. It's giving advantage to somebody who has fallen behind in a competition. Mm -hmm. My sister. <laughs> <laughs> or anybody. Algorithmically, right? So it doesn't care if it's your sister. Okay. So, yeah, that's basically. A lot of games that are competitions between a whole bunch of different people, what they do is sometimes they call it catch up, sometimes they call it rubber banding, um, is that basically if you're not in the lead, you get some kind of boost to your agency. And if you are in the lead, you get some kind of reduction in your agency. 
And so, um, you know, Mario Kart does that, super famous for that, right? The blue shell thing, the star thing. Like, you'll get different items depending on if you're in the front and the back. Um, like, every Midway game, like, even basketball, Showtime, racing, lots of racing games. Anyone want to name something that's maybe not obvious that sounds cool? Yeah. League of Legends recently oh, applied a system where if you're behind, they increase your passive gold reward. Huh. Okay, I don't know enough about the game to understand that. How about maybe one more? Yeah. Rascals, okay. Okay, so the leader has to do more work than everyone else. That's interesting. That's kind of like a different way to do it. Huh. Well, are you arguing that that's bad for engagement still? I am going to tell you what I'm arguing. <laughs> because um, actually no what I want to argue is not that this is great or this is terrible but that there's aspects of this that are important for you to understand and not a lot of people think about the trade-offs here when you consider what rubber banding does now the intent behind rubber banding in the first place um, because there was a very valiant intention about it um, it's, it's kind of multifaceted it does a bunch of things so for one, you get statistically closer results, right? You can see how that can be intrinsically because what you're doing is everyone who's losing, you're making them better. Everyone who's doing really good, you're making them worse. So you're bringing the field in to a more compact field. And it is more exciting because you get a whole host of consequences just by way of doing that. Um, you know, people pass each other back and forth, whether it's a score game for basketball or whether it's actually a positional game like racing. And it's more exciting, too, because of all these things, so long as this effect is imperceptible by the player. And this is the really key thing. Has anybody played a game that maybe did rubber banding or penalized them or made them go faster in a way that like, they didn't expect? Like, was, has anyone had like, a moment where they figured out like the game is doing something janky? Mario Party. Yeah. Yeah, Mario Party. So like, there's a thing where you can have an option of stealing something from someone else, and if the person stealing is in last place, oh, it's two stars. But if they're in first place, it's ten coins. And that's like really consistent. <laughs> <laughs> and if you play it enough, you realize like, what? No, something's going on here. Yeah. So this is really interesting because yeah. What's up? Oh, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, when the demo for Jet Moto Three came out way back when. Yeah. I was messing around with the demo just playing with the physics. Yeah. And because I was sort of going back and forth in one area, like just going down the track back, when I looked at the, um, the mini map of where the other racers were, they literally stopped. <laughs> yeah, was, that's, they did that, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. And so I was wondering why, and so I drove up to catch up to them, but then they, didn't, they weren't stopped anymore. <laughs> so, that was cool. so now would you say that game is fair or unfair? I don't know, I had a lot of fun playing with that one area of the track. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the other thing this does is there's actually a really important accessibility component here. And this is what people mostly talk about when they think of rubber banding in a good way. Because what, what rubber banding does is that if you're not very skilled, it allows you to enjoy a higher level of performance results than what you'd otherwise be able to attain all by yourself. Does that make sense? because your car is just faster than everyone else. Um, and there's, there's some pluses to that. That's, that's good, that's not all bad. But we also have a whole bunch of really um, idiosyncratic negative effects. And these were all unintentional. And these are the ones that um, you know, are not so obvious, but they have a really strong effect on what this does to players. And the first one, and uh, least importantly, actually, is that in this type of structure, now all of a sudden, very strange strategies become the optimal strategy. Uh, specifically, you don't want to give, you don't want to be in first place, do you, in Mario Kart? No, nope. nope. right before the end. That's, That's right. The shell's coming, you get the brakes and let someone pass you quick. Yeah, nobody wants to be in first place. Everyone wants to be in second place until the very end and then pass to be in first place. What's funny is, uh, in the more recent Mario Karts, they slightly changed the mechanics so that uh, as soon as the 
blue shell launches, yeah. it locks onto the person that's currently in a first. Oh. So if you slam on your brakes, you're still the one who gets targeted. <laughs> <laughs> That'll teach them. <laughs> 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 so, so this is bizarre because in a competition you'd normally think, okay, well, I, I want to give 100% of my effort all the time, and now in order to win, I'm actually deliberately modulating how hard I'm trying, which is very strange to me. Um, the other thing that happens is when you start to notice that rubber banding is happening to you, you start to feel cheated. And the reason why you feel cheated is because you are being cheated. <laughs> What, what rubber banding does to a player who is able to learn how to do a move or some kind of thing in, in the process of playing the game, what you're doing in rubber banding is you're telling the, the person who has just earned some kind of new skill in racing or playing Showtime basketball or whatever, that uh, as soon as you use that newly found skill, we're going to beat you down and send you back. And con consider, consider how motivating just learning how to do something and applying it is. Now consider in light of that, how defeating that is to motivation. Why would you want to play something that punishes you after you learn how to get better at it? That's what's happening here. Even though it's statistically leveling the playing field, and this is one of the, like, the, the, the common undercurrents around all this stuff is that you're, you're achieving a statistical result that makes sense, but if you actually think about the dynamics of what's happening to the player, it's a very, very different picture. So here's the funny thing, right? Okay, there's some situations, right? When is rubber banding great? Well, if you're an unskilled player, it's great, for the reasons I just stated. Yeah? Um, kind of, I think the opposite happens with the unskilled players, where uh, they might believe that they've gotten good at it, mm -hmm. and then when they realize that it was not them, reward is kind of taken away. Yeah, it's like, it's like it's great until you figure out what's going on behind the scenes, isn't it? You're like, you think you're flying and you realize someone's holding you up. Yeah, and, and it's somehow, and it's even worse because you felt like you were deceived through it, right? So it's even worse than not having actually gotten there and then being disappointed from it. So yeah, if you're not so good at playing whatever game, then rubber banding is great. If you're not interested in getting better, then who cares? then rubber banding is fine. If you're not taking the outcome of the game seriously, then okay, these kinds of modulations are fine too. And if you're watching, it's fantastic. <laughs> and the funny thing is I'm thinking of like, well, well, where does all these things happen at the same time? And I always think of Dave and Buster's. <laughs> but the thing that I don't like about this is that <laughs> it's, the, the whole, okay, it assumes that there's something that sometimes is called like a, a steady state, like theory of somebody's uh, mental capacity or their ability, where it's like, right, like people tend generally have two different like outlooks on how smart they are. They either think like, okay, well, like my, my, my level of intelligence or ability is kind of like always at the same level. Like, okay, that person's smart at math and they're always good at math, but I'm not good at math. So I'll never be good at math, that kind of thing. And then there's the, the other side of it, which is there's another philosophy, which is like, okay, well, um, well, no, you can actually get better at whatever it is you're, you want to get better at. You just have to put in the effort and try. And the, those two different approaches, this kind of dynamic encourages the steady state thinking of I can't get any better. I have to rely on these kinds of devices in order to enjoy the dynamics of that people normally enjoy when they're like really good racers or basketball players or whatever. Yeah. Um, what do you think about, I don't, I'm not sure, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but in games, playing games like Tekken and like uh, Marvel versus Capcom where you have something that like boosts your stats when you get low health, like is that kind of a problem? Like an ultra meter? Yeah, like, like an X factor in Marvel versus Capcom. That's a reward for failure type. Yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, that's true, yeah. I, I, I'd say it's not quite the same when you know it's going to hit that. So like one, it, it, it's, it's just a strategy that you're actually, it's a, your health bar becomes a resource, not just your, your what you're going to die from. Right. So you can plan to get hit by like weak attacks from your opponent, 
and then a lot we should combo that'll kill them for sure. So you're kind of like playing a waiting game. So it becomes a resource, yeah, not like a, a strategy. Yeah. 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 yeah, that kind of kind of goes with some of the earlier dynamics I was explaining too. Yeah. Hey, um, so um, it's hard to keep players' attention in this day and age. So if you're not developing systems like this, how yeah. do you keep somebody engaged long enough to get past? You don't want your player to get frustrated and quit when there's 300 million free other things they could go download yes. or their parents bought them or they bought themselves. Mm -hmm. So how do you, what's the solution? To I hope I can address that with the remainder of the talk. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't be sorry. Okay, one more. You've gone too many times. I know. <laughs> okay, no, green guy. No, I wanted to add on to what you were saying before because um, what, what, what the hang there was talking about, like there are some mechanics in games like League of Legends or Team Fortress 2 where little small, um, like either a character choice or a weapon choice which allows you to be able to catch up if you are at low health. And th those are really just more of a, a different set of strategies than anything else. Yeah, that's true. Okay, fine. Trent? Uh, so I take issue with unskilled players. It actually has nothing to do with your skill level with players. It's the skill disparity between players. Explain. Right, like the, uh, it, like, two newbies actually will be on the same, like, they can be totally unskilled players, but they're actually going to have fun. Like, it's it's basically why I can play Towerfall with Kyle, who's the world champion in Towerfall, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, because of that, like, it's the, it's the skill disparity, right? Like, you can have two experts that are playing at the same level, or yeah. two newbies that are playing at the same level. If you combine that, like, a newbie and an expert, that's where it comes into play. That's where the issue is. Right. But don't you think, well, what do you mean by the issue? Because even if That's two people are closely matched, um, rubber banding will still diminish but there their... There rubber banding if they're both evenly matched, because one will be significantly ahead of the other, generally speaking. Oh, so okay, so I see what you're exactly. saying there. So you have two terrible players, they both go really slow all yeah. the way around the map, and then there's no rubber banding. I, I guess at that point it depends on the implementation of the rubber banding, right. you know? So yeah, because like most of the common situations in these, right, it's like... It's very binary, um, so it's like right, like just by virtue of being, if there's only two competitors in Mario Kart, right, like just by virtue of being in the first place slot, mm -hmm. even if you're just barely slot, the better you get conferred all these disadvantages and vice versa. I mean, I think in, in Mario, Mario Kart, that that's an extreme, is Mario Kart. Yeah. yeah. Well, in Mario Kart, <laughs> if there's that big skill disparity and you're playing with your little sister, she's not gonna become unengaged and just wanna quit, and you, maybe you want her to play. You don't want that other person to quit because they're not good. Maybe you want the competition even though you're better, right? Yeah, and I mean, that's when so you know other casuals. other considerations come into play, like you're at yeah. Dave and Buster's and you wanna play with everyone and no yeah. one wants to be left out. I guess that goes under who takes the outcome of the game seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah, that wasn't intended to be snarky, by the way. No, <laughs> Yeah. Back to the future. <laughs> do, people, do people think he's right? Uh, I think he's been in the game. Yeah. Okay, yeah, there's like eight of them, right? right. So I was... Yeah. Standing outside of the game specifically, I know, like, for example, Risk, right? If you get killed early on in Risk, now you're, like, hanging out while the other people that you're there with are playing Risk for hours. So maybe you should go do the dishes. <laughs> somebody else eliminated the blue player, that person who had that card will still win the game. So then I kind of built this thing where you didn't want to eliminate somebody because you might accidentally win the game for somebody else. Like how do you how would you think that kind of fits in with like Yeah, that's kind of subtle. I'm thinking about now, like, do we consider Risk to be a skill game or no? No. no. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it is. <laughs> uh, Jeremy. There's One more after Jeremy, and then we'll continue. I, I just wanted to sort of bring up, there's a weird flip side to this, where someone is so good that they can beat the person they know is rubber banding, yeah. they get a little bit of extra pleasure from that. Well, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that would be really satisfying. Yeah. Okay, you've gone a bunch of times. Anybody new who hasn't gone at all? How about behind Jeremy? I haven't heard you that much. In the game Jack 2, there is a... Uh, Game inside. You mean Jack and Daxter? Yes. Okay, okay. The game inside, though, 
when you race the um, the bikes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that that game has a bit of a of a quirk to the AI. Um, it actually learns what how you race and improves the AI based off that. Ooh. So it get, you can never can like play the play that game extensively because the AI actually learns how to cheat <laughs> without failure. That sounds horrible. Because a part of the map <laughs> you jump over like a large section and you can skip a yeah. large part. But if you do that once, the AI will be able to pull that move off every <laughs> single lap perfectly without without crashing or dying. <laughs> so at that point, you, you can't play the game anymore. <laughs> so if you lose, like turn it off and reload. Pretty, I guess. pretty much. <laughs> Otherwise, it's 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's crazy. That's like a little that gets out of how drill fast. Like okay, so last part. So so those are the four things that I told you about where learning is compromised. So it's been a lot of negative talk. So I figured, okay, maybe I end it with some positive talk, right? So. How can we think of games as good teachers and how can we actually accomplish this stuff? So one thing I want to note to you guys is that the reason why this type of topic doesn't get a lot of chatter is because learning in a game is actually one of the least salient, in other words, one of the least noticeable or obvious aspects of the game. This is one from one, this is a graph from one of my previous talks, but basically my point here is that Look, these are all different aspects of a video game. And you have to be able to, these are basically in order of depth in, in reverse order of saliency. So you notice these things first before you notice the further one, don't you? Right? And so the thing is, is that learning happens like way at the bottom. You have to be able to like notice all of these other things before you actually start learning from the game. And so this stuff is very subtle, and that's why it's hard to talk about. Okay, so the thing I want to end with is that, look, it seems as though there's a choice between accessibility and depth, especially when you always see examples that the most accessible games a lot of times are very shallow. And very deep games like, I don't know, EVE Online keeps coming to mind for some reason, are, are very inaccessible, aren't they? And just because that's the common case though does not mean you can't have both. You totally can have both, and it's an ideal in my opinion, to have both. And that ideal is to have a systematically deep game, but at the same time make it accessible without compromising that depth. Because if there is depth and you can't access it, it's like it may as well not be there. What's the point if you can't access it, right? Okay, so I want to do a very quick small example of how you can take a game and add a device to it to make its depth much, much more accessible in a very simple way. And this, I, nobody talks about this either. This is really cool. So in Gran Turismo, um, most of you have played Gran Turismo, right? It's a racing game. Right? You guys know how racing games work. So there's this thing in Gran Turismo that a lot of people aren't aware of, and that's because it's not like really documented at all, and that's another separate accessibility issue. But the biggest problem when you're playing a racing game, especially one that is realistic or supposed to be realistic, is that it's really hard to tell how much you're supposed to slow down for a turn. It's really hard to gauge that because most of the cues that you get are not enough to give you that information, right? You can't feel how fast you're going, can you? And so, right, one way that a lot of games address it is that they just do the arcade style handling, which is kind of like those Band-Aid methods I described, right? They just make it easier to go through the turn. But in Gran Turismo, they did something different. Instead of making it easier to go through the turn, what they did was they actually gave you more information about how to negotiate the turn. And they did it in this beautifully sublime, compact way that um, actually I'd be surprised if any of you know about it. But anyway, here's what happens, okay? Let's say you're, you're driving, okay? You see all the gauges in the middle, right? So that three is your gear indicator, that 91 is your speed. And what happens is when you approach a turn, there's this red number shows up as you near a turn, okay? And this little red number tells you a whole bunch of really critical things all at once. What it's telling you first is it's telling you what gear you should be in for the next corner coming up. So you automatically have some information about the severity of the turn. The other thing it's telling you, and this is the really, really subtle, important aspect, 
is that it actually gives you information about your breaking point, which is, this is the critical, most inaccessible part of a racing game in general. What it does is, as you approach the breaking point, that number starts flashing. And it just so happens that if you're, if you're not driving crazy, if you're pretty much on the racing line, your breaking point is actually on the fourth blink of that number, for the most part, give or take. There's some exceptions, but basically what it's telling you is that if you start braking on the fourth blink, you're gonna be able to slow down enough to accelerate out of that corner once you've stopped slowing down. Now, how do you know when to stop slowing down? Well, the number, that red number will go away as soon as you're going slow enough to then go back on the power and accelerate out of the turn. So just by virtue of this little thing, all of a sudden you don't need to, you don't need to look around at any of the other things. You don't have to do 70 laps to figure out where your braking points are. You don't need to find out uh, like, okay, like that little brush on the side of, you know, the course. You don't have to do all these complex calculations of, okay, well, you know, usually I'm going 120 here, and if I'm going that fast, then that, that little brush is my breaking point. And normally, what a person has to do to figure this out is a lot of trial and error. And this device allows you to have the information you need to negotiate the game competently without having to go through all that trial and error. So this is the sort of thing I'm talking about, right? This, game, this thing, assuming you know how it works, that's the other problem, Right? This thing suddenly made a whole bunch of depth in the game much more accessible to any given player without compromising any of it. So there's a couple things I identified that games that are both super accessible and super deep have in common. And these are, these are the ones I noticed. So one of them is that kind of like what you were talking about, David, earlier on. Right? There's just certain things that um, are easy to figure out just by random manipulation. Like uh, Tetris, right? Give any person Tetris, and just by virtue of them randomly pressing the inputs, they'll pretty easily be able to learn how to modulate that game and how to play competently. There's also, right, there's some things that you just naturally have a high affinity to spontaneously learning through repetition and practice. And this varies from person to person, right? That's why some people decide to like pursue golf, and some people decide to do like I don't know martial arts or something. Um, the affinity varies from person to person, but the affinity also actually varies from activity to activity, right? It's a lot easier to figure out Tetris for everybody than it is to figure out um, like chess, say, right? So the other important stuff is you get lots of feedback on a lot of different levels of granularity that's immediate and it's clear. Right, long learning curves basically just means like the game has to have enough depth in the first place. Um, and I've also noticed a lot of times, right, like random factors don't impact, they're either completely non-existent or they don't impact the outcome of the game. And then also you tend to have a lot of visibility into the factors that do affect the outcome of the game. You get a lot of information about what's happening. Um, think about like Pac-Man. Right? Pac-Man, you have all the information of the game on the screen at all times. Think of that in comparison to something like an RTS, where you have zero information on the screen at all times. <laughs> Anyone, can anybody think of an example of a game that fits all these things, that's maybe a good example? I have a couple, but I want to see what you guys think. Uh, between, uh, in the Civilization game, between, uh, I think it was Civ 3 and Civ 4, uh, terrain matters a lot. Mm -hmm. And you'll only know this if you like go into like their thick manual and look that stuff up. But yeah. I believe it was in Civ 4, they add on this little thing that says, here's all the terrain you're on, here's all the terrain they're on, here's all the bonuses that you're getting. So they give you more information in the game. Yeah, so I, I think that's almost, well, there's trade-offs usually. Yeah. Portal? <laughs> Say? Portal? Portal, yeah, Portal's pretty good. Portal is pretty good. You know what the problem was I had with Portal though? And I'm curious if anyone else had this issue. So I got to the point with that game where I was like, I knew what I was supposed to do, like what order of actions in order to get through it. But because I was just so bad at actually modulating the character through the space, it just felt like I was beating my head up against the wall. Like, okay, I'm supposed to hit that and hit that and do that. Like I knew the answer, right? But I couldn't actually execute the solution. 
So that, that kind of killed it for me, but. Portal 1, right? Portal 1, yeah. Climbing. Yes. Climbing yeah, way back. Mega Man X. Mega Man X. Okay. Well, that was like one of the easier Mega Mans, huh? Well, there was a YouTube video show where a guy breaks down exactly how Mega Man X shows you how to do everything without ever telling you a single oh, word of how to do it. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's I don't know that video specifically, but yeah, that's a beautiful thing. Um, like one thing you just reminded me of. Anyone play Klonoa? Yes. Yeah, oh Kl my God. Klonoa is such a good game, and they, they I, I'm. It's a shame that the last one, Klonoa Two, is out on PS2, and we haven't had a good one since then. But um, one of the things that they did in that game uh, is an example of what you're saying. So there's this thing in the game that's like this uh, wind current that just blows things upward, right? And they teach you how this wind current works by in a two-stage process. And it's completely intrinsic to the game, right? They don't throw up any dialogues. They don't make you read. They don't interrupt what you're doing. These are all like really bad endemic tutorial things that I think they do all the time in other games. What they do is they, you're walking up to an enemy. And as soon as you get close enough to the enemy, the enemy actually starts going backwards. So now he's leading you, right? And then the enemy jumps backward onto this kind of like stream of particles going upward. And then you watch the, it interact with that stream of particles. And what the game is doing is it's teaching you, this is actually a tutorial, you just don't know it. It's teaching you how that device works with another enemy before you have a chance to interact with it. So it's, that's really important because if you hadn't had that there, you wouldn't know what your, player, what your player character would do in that situation. The way that it looks is unclear. Maybe you'll fall, maybe you won't. Right? But if you see it happen to the enemy first, before you get an opportunity to interact with it, now you know, it's like, oh, okay, this is how this thing works. This is what it does. And you already know how it's going to work before you actually engage with it. And this is the kind of thing I'm talking about, too. So any other games anyone want to mention? Yeah. I'm not the depth of it, but I think Super Mario Brothers is just a, a, a wonderful uh, example of, of most all of these. And it's funny because <laughs> there is also a reverse video of what you uh, uh, hmm. If Super Mario Brothers were made today, and the game opens off and it's like, congratulations, you're the game. Press the D-pad right to move Mario. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you can press A to jump. All these stupid dialogue yeah, boxes it, versus it, the game itself. It sounds like a joke, but that's literally what a lot of games do, and it, it infuriates a lot of people, and it, you lose players that way, too. Yeah. It's noticeable in, uh, actually, in Skyrim. In the first dungeon that you enter, yeah. you don't really encounter too many traps. And in the, the first trap you come across, or, or you have a puzzle gate. If you notice when you go up, it, as you get close, it triggers an event where a, a bandit will go up and flip a lever that will trigger the trap and basically kill him. That way, letting you know for the first time, this is how these traps work. Yeah, that's that's if you don't fantastic. Have it right, it's going to shoot you. Yep. I don't want to yeah, that's great. Well, you didn't go. <laughs> so these are some other examples I thought of just off the top of my head that I think fall into this category. Um, so the last thing I want to cover is last few things that are important for achieving depth that's accessible. Um, and I, I've, I've hinted on this a couple times, right? There's there's certain activities that you do. Okay, that have an intrinsic level of mappability to being accessible or deep. And it's just the activity, it's intrinsic to the activity. In other words, depending on what you're designing, you can choose to design an activity that maps better to being highly accessible and deep or maps worse. Can you guys, um, do you guys understand how that could be? Maybe somebody can think of an example since I can't write the second. Um, let's like, okay, what's like a really, really hard game to just even start playing? Dark Souls. Dark Souls, yeah. Actually, here, yeah. yeah. Anything made by Paradox? I'm not, I'm not as familiar with. Crusader Kings. Yeah, okay, okay, you know what? I'm trying, I want to think of like two things that are actually the same type of game. So think about like, What's a really simple platformer? <laughs> okay, okay, something like, actually, okay, like Super Mario Brothers versus Ratchet and Clank, right? 
not Ratchet and Clank, I'm sorry, Super Meat Boy, right? So, no, actually that's not a great example either. Okay, so, no, I'm thinking of like an example that has like really complex controls and really simple controls to do the same sort of thing. So, okay, yeah, so like piloting a mech versus like modulating, you know, Tetris, okay? So there, there, there you go, right? So basically, one of them is deeper and a lot more complicated, but it just doesn't map well. Uh, who's played the, I haven't played any Mech Warrior games really recently, but like, who's played Steel Battalion? That was terrible. <laughs> yeah, so you know what? I mean, there's ter I think terrible things about it is that it's so inaccessible. One of the beautiful things about it is that it's like one of the only games where you can actually operate this mech with three independent, totally independent axes of control which it takes, it takes you a long time to actually figure out how to do it. You know, that's something that does not map well to an accessible experience because it's just, just from its sheer complexity. Um, you know, something like Tetris, right? That's a whole different thing. So there's that. The other thing is that you have to consider the game as a whole like systematic thing, okay? You can't just consider it. A lot of times in the professional world, they look out upon games as uh, basically just collections of features. And that's going to draw you into problems because um, features interact with each other in subtle ways. And so you have to be able to apprehend the game as a systematic whole and how that affects your players. And you, this is probably one of the hardest ones, which is you have to have the ability to read what, when you're observing players play their game, play your game. You have to have the ability to very accurately read what not only their emotional state is, but their cognitive state. And the reason why this is so hard is that you never know when you're wrong. You just won't hardly ever know if you're wrong or not. Because being wrong or right is kind of tantamount to knowing what they're thinking, right? And so I don't know what to say about this, but <laughs> it's just really hard. It's hard to know when you're wrong, but it's really important to be right about that sort of stuff. And that's all I got for you guys tonight. I feel like it's midnight or something. <laughs> <laughs> do we, do we want to ask questions or you guys want to just give up? <laughs> Maybe. Yep. I was wondering, like, do you think the same kind of, like, what happens when you start, like, putting the idea of, like, telling a story through the mechanics on top of that? Like, I don't bring it up just because adventure games. Yeah, like, that's that's a mess I don't want to get into. Okay. Right. <laughs> I mean, I'll get into it later, but it's, it's a whole, it's a huge can of worms. Anybody else? David? Yeah. You sure? <laughs> Wait, no one else other than David? <laughs> oh, okay, now they come out. Okay, fine. Yeah, I, know. I just want to comment about, about the grinding thing, because I, I do grind in a lot of games. I kind of yeah. like grinding. I like building up an overwhelming force and then absolutely destroying my enemy, as mm -hmm. opposed to you know, some, some of the other options I had. But there's actually a lot of to do in grinding, because there's sort of the metagame involved. Like, even referencing, like, MMOs. It's like, if I can get to level 10, in you know two days, and you get to level ten in three days. I am better at the game than you, even though we're both just grinding. Yeah, I guess I guess depending on the game, yeah, they can you can so use some strategic decision making in order to grind more or less efficiently. Yeah, and then sure. you know you're increasing your player skill in terms of how to work interface more efficiently, and hotkeys, and setting up the, the controllers, and yeah, that's true. where to go and, and what to do. So there there is a lot. Of there's a lot of, of, of game you can still be involved in, even with grinding, but it's definitely a player preference. Yeah, and your mileage with that may vary depending on the game, too. I mean, some games just don't give you that latitude. Some games give you a lot of depth and latitude there. Yeah? Uh, just kind of going off that, I'm not necessarily sure that's true. I think that's more you're learning how to manipulate the experience system, because one of the things I notice when I go on the forums a lot, uh, so you'll have players that grind a lot to game levels and you know become better, and they'll think they're, that they're these really good players. But statistically speaking, inevitably they come.
come up against someone who is better at the game than they are, and they're probably at lower level, and they go into a fight against one another, and the higher level player just gets destroyed because he's not as good at the game. So the person that's been grinding the whole time, they then go online and then they just cry foul. They're like, oh, it's imbalanced. I'm really good at this game. So obviously this is just imbalanced rather than like, yeah, that, that happens. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually funny, like, it, if you, right, like, when, think about when people, when they're playing, somebody's playing a competition, and when they lose, or when, some, when they get beaten or something, think about, like, whether they tend to, like, like, where do, where do they put the blame? Do they blame, like, I'm not good enough this time? Or do they blame, like, that person was cheating? Or, oh, that guy was much better than me, I hope I one day to be as good as him? Or I guess. they blame the game. Or they blame the game, right? The game is to blame, though, the more that they do abuse these type of things, which is kind Well, of funny. Uh, that's, that's what happens, too. Yeah, Tristan. Um, so I kind of wanted to ask you about, like, randomization and uh, battle toads, because... <laughs> okay. um, so I agree with you for the most part, but I don't actually think battle toads is teaching me a whole lot beyond memorizing the exact sequence of events that it's presenting me in the section that you're talking about. Okay. So... Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I mean, there, there are certain games, like, um, for me, the example is SWAT 3 versus, like, Rainbow Six. Rainbow okay. Six taught me to memorize where all of the terrorists were, and SWAT 3 taught me to use strategy every time I entered a room. And it did that by making those elements randomized. So yeah, you never well, know where a terrorist will be. There is, okay, so there's, like, a couple of different, like, topics simultaneously here. Sure. Um, there's, like, yeah, it is true that, okay, wait, you're, I'm getting confused now. See the first part that you said again? Well, I mean, yeah. as far as rope memorization versus actual skill building. Yeah, so, memor okay, so every different activity that you can get better at, right, that has like a different amount of like transferability to another activity. And who knows what that is, right? I mean, that's like, that's so hard to put a finger on, you know? I mean, I could say, look, if you play, I think, I think if you play Battletoads all the time, even though you've memorized that sequence really well, I still think that there's probably some transfer to other hand-eye coordination scenarios. How much? I haven't done the experiments, I can't tell you. But I think that there's a little bit. Um, that, I think, just varies from activity to activity, and like it's the affinity thing, right? I think it changes from person to person, too. What was the second thing you were well, saying? Well, I mean, I think that in a lot of ways, randomization can prepare you for a system of play. Yeah. And like, so my it, it can. So yeah, you're right. In that sense, like randomization can be really good. One of the, like, More randomized input than output. It's like, so it's not randomized damage factors or something, but randomized Yeah, factors. so that's actually, I'm really glad you make that distinction because that's really important. Because when people talk about stuff like randomization, usually you just think about like, okay, well, you just tend to collect everything in the same group. And that's not, that's not true, right? There can be very different kinds of randomization that do different things. Um, so yeah, it depends on how you do it. And so like, yeah, there's definitely... Um, like one of the reasons, okay, so I play racing games all the time, right? So I like, I much prefer to play against human opponents than computer opponents are just doing laps for the fastest time because there is that kind of random factor that unexpected things can happen, right? And that's really appealing to me. I like playing in those situations where unexpected random things can happen. Although if it was, if they're, well, they do, <laughs> the irony is they do have a, rubber banding system in that game too, but you can turn it off in certain cases. Um, so yeah, those are two different kinds of things that get randomized on different ends, and they have different effects. Have you seen the more elegant way the problem you talked about in Gran Turismo is handled in some of the newer racing games? Like, what's the one that's not Need for Speed that just came out for Xbox One? Forza. Forza 5. I don't know how they do it in 5, but the funny thing is in 6, it's like... Uh, I could spend like an hour talking about the AI behavior, like it's a huge well, mess. Did you see the line that was drawn in the image you showed us? Yeah, yeah. And it was in blue? Yeah, that's the racing in the, line. In the new Forza, that line, yeah. it, it tells, it's, it's gauge red, yellow, green. Oh yeah, you know what, actually, uh, that's another great example, and yeah. if you turn on the line in GT6, it will do that too. It will tell you where the breaking point is. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a more literal way of doing the same thing. Yeah, it kind of gets in your way. I, I actually found it a lot harder to read than the device I explained, yeah. which is probably why I ended up explaining it. <laughs> yeah. I saw it in the, I think I ranked it, yeah, it was the newer uh, Gran Turismo, and they had that, and that actually adjusted dynamically. So if I'm coming up to the corner and I let off the gas, my, my breaking point starts to move away from me. Um, but it made it 
Yeah. And it was kind of like you were saying with, uh, I was not really invested in getting good at Gran Turismo because I had just rented it and I was going to have it for a few days. I just wanted to enjoy it right now mm -hmm. versus putting in the long term investment. But also, again, it was not imposed on me. I could, you know, yeah. All right, so I actually wanted to talk a bit about education in this, okay. in the like, form of like actual the school. <laughs> yeah, um, okay. So you see a lot of those negative effects from the dynamics and mechanics in real world situations in education. Really? You do. Rewarding failures? Rewarding oh, that, failures. yes. Yeah, I can, yeah, I can see that for sure. Okay, I see where you're going. Have you ever considered how helpful it would be to apply game design to education? Yeah, although I kind of felt like it used to be more like that a while ago. <laughs> Maybe it a couple decades ago. It used to be a <laughs> because the thing that everyone complains about in education, right, is that people are just getting pushed forward even though they're not actually acquiring the skills. So essentially it's a grind. They sit in the same desk for a year. At the end of the year, they get to sit in a bigger desk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's, I don't, I don't know if I'm, I'm prepared or able or qualified <laughs> to talk at length about that stuff. Yeah. Um, I have a question on how you prioritize what you're teaching. So in the example where you have a heat map, yeah. um, if you're testing to see players getting stuck on something like, say, battle codes where you, you don't necessarily want to teach memorization, mm -hmm. but say you want to teach puzzle solving, and if people are getting stuck on the... Uh, jumping puzzle of one that just move in a certain area. Right. Yeah. When, is it, when do you think it's okay to teach one thing over another? Um, do you well, focus on one thing for the game? Or? Okay, tell me, tell me if this doesn't address what you're asking. I think that instead of thinking about it more that way, it's more useful to think about it in terms of like, I as a designer, I have a puzzle or a challenge. I want to challenge the player with something. I want to put up this obstacle for them to overcome, right? So you think about like, what does the player need to know? What, is the, what do they need to have mastered in order to be able to actually surmount whatever that obstacle is? So the first thing, uh, you've played Metroid, right? What? Met no. Metroid? <laughs> I, it's funny, but some people have yeah. it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> one? The first one. <laughs> so, um, the first like three screens of Metroid have an incredible amount of depth of teaching in them, right? And they, they teach you things in a modular way, actually very much like school does in math, right? You wanna teach the player, um, you wanna break down your mechanics of the game into its atomic components, and then you wanna teach the player the simplest things. You basically have an order of starting from like uh, your simplest rules, right? To more sophisticated interactions. And so that will dictate the order and priority so that you want to teach. Teaching them about the obstacles that are moving. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, so for example, right, like what's the simplest thing in Metroid? Moving, right? Moving left and right. Uh, what's the next simplest thing? Is jumping, right? Well, um, I don't know if I don't know how obvious it is, but like in the right in the beginning of Metroid, you actually stand on a very small plateau, which means that you're able to move left and right fine. But then after you get off that plateau. Right? You can't really go in any further unless you figure out how to jump. Right? And so they, they challenge you uh, without any explicit instruction, but the challenges are one by one very gently built upon each other. You also notice that when you go like in the beginning to the left, the first jump you have to make is actually on a convex structure. Right? Instead of like the ledge is like this, instead of like this, right? And why? Well, there, there's a reason for it because it's much easier. If you're not good at modulating your left and right, then um, you, can, you just need to hold down the, the left button and jump and you'll make it up there, right? If it was concave, it would be way harder. So they give you the most atomic, most simplest challenges first. And the beautiful thing about doing things in that way is that you know when the player's gotten that ball power up, in Metroid, you know for a fact that they have mastered certain things. They have mastered, they know how to use the ball for one, right? Because they got out of that hole that they got it from. They know how to jump, they know how to move left and right. So you know those things for a fact. So now you can build additional challenges based on these assumptions, right? And that's what the game is, right? Skill games, you're testing the player. And then once you know that you've passed, they've passed that test, 
you can assume certain things about what they know, and you use that to modularly build further challenges, and so on and so forth. Make sense? One more? Okay, last one. I'm going to pick someone. I'm going to give priority to someone who's never said anything. But no takers. He's been dying to go. Who's, okay. I, want, I, I wanted to go back to the Gran Turismo example because that's because um, I've been playing a lot of those um, installments in that series and it's actually been a great, um, I was going to talk about was a great way that a series like Gran Turismo can progress in some ways because in Gran Turismo 3, I noticed that the, the, uh, blink, the blinking uh -huh. feature and things like that, but it's so like, so transparent and so like out of the way that it just kind of adds to the experience rather than something that you would necessarily have to notice. The driving line in Gran Turismo 3, that they actually had that in the license test, so it was something that helped you guys through that, which is basically yeah, yeah. the license test with a tutorial. And the great thing I like about the way that they implemented it in 6 is that is that it is dynamic in a way, particularly when you have it breaking in the turns as well, and they implement that in default with all those races, um, even though you can turn both of those features off as far as I know, because I've, um, been, I've been playing playing around with it with the copy that I have up in the norm here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess what you're saying. Gran Turismo 6 basically was becoming more accessible to, um, than the previous installments of the games, but it still kept it's it still kept them available. It, 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 there was still that way to um, implement implement them in a way that it wasn't too um, restrictive on anything else. Yeah, I mean they didn't they didn't compromise the actual challenge of the game itself. What they did was they gave you devices to help you get better better than you would be able to on your own, right? Yeah. But he, I even think that they haven't taken it far enough because you know you know, like all those screens where you, um, you can change all your part settings yeah. and all your tuning and stuff like that, right? Yeah. One thing I'd wish, like here's another idea, right? One thing I'd wish they'd do that they've never done, it'd probably take a lot of time to develop, but um, you know, the biggest problem when you're tuning stuff in that game is that you can't tell the changes to your adjustments until you go out and you do the race again, right? And a lot of times it's so subtle, it's like, well, what changed? I don't know. It kind of felt better, maybe. In Gran Turismo 6, though, they, yeah. they actually specifically implemented a little, uh, an arbitrary score that basically sums up the performance that you can get with, um, between cars. And the right, but, but I'm talking about like subtle changes, like you're changing the toe or the camber on your suspension, or you're changing the ride height. And basically, right, like, the problem now is that you have to do a lot of work to figure out if that specific adjustment was better or worse for you. But one thing they could do, for example, is um, let's say that you're, um, okay, let's say you're adjusting camber, right? Like, why not have like a running model of the car going at like a constant speed on a radius, right? Just going around, showing how the dynamics of its cornering forces change when you're just changing that one number, right? Like why can't you? Why won't they show that information to you before you having to try that for yourself? Like that would be a next stage of evolution to make it more accessible without compromising. <laughs> well, that there's, it gets complicated. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there's lots of rubber banding in that game, though. Yeah, just not in It's just not in the overt ways that other games do it. Well. You you know that you know that computer cars will like change their speed by up to like ten seconds per lap, according to your performance. Just a little bit, but I mean, you can just <laughs> like that's a like that's a huge I've been, difference. I've been in several different races where where cars can literally pass each other up computer cars. Yeah. And they will they will literally overpass you, and they wouldn't really give you much leeway with that, particularly on the smaller circuits if you're just starting out. Yeah, it's 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 so it's so complicated and subtle what they do, and none of it's good because um, that's a whole other hour conversation. It's not really that. It's not really something that they would need to consider that much because it's really for the enthusiasts. Yeah. Well, you know, there's. You could also argue whether it's for enthusiasts or mass market too. That's another discussion. Okay, I guess we're done for real. Thanks so much, guys.
Cool. Well, I hope we've all ascended to a new level of game design after that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just want to give a shout out to Aaron and UAT for helping out with the pizza, and also all of you guys that donate every month. Uh, it really helps out. Um, and thanks for coming out, and I'll see you next month. <laughs>